This video is brought to you by SailRight. Visit SailRight.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. Hi, I'm Eric Grant with SailRight. Today we're going to show you how to reupholster this pontoon seat. A lot of pontoons have seats very similar to this one. This one's in very bad shape, so we're going to show you how to redo it. Here's what the pontoon bench seat looked like before we were done. And here's what it looks like afterwards. We will show you every step required to make the seat bottom. In the final chapter of this video, we'll highlight the materials and tools we used, including how much material is required for a seat like this. We'll be fabricating it from a material called Eversoft, which is an indoor-outdoor vinyl available from Sailrite. In this video, we're gonna show you how to make the seat bottom for this pontoon bench. If you'd like to see a video on how to make the backrest, we have a video for that, the side arms, and the base. We have links down in the description. Let's get started. The first step is to remove the old vinyl. And you can see that there are holes actually in the vinyl here that uh, left the foam exposed. When this happens, the foam starts to deteriorate. So we're probably going to have to replace the foam or repair it. You'll notice that they have installed some pleats here. Those pleats give it a decorative look. However, every time you do that, it presents more needle holes. The more needle holes you have, the more possibilities for the water to leak through those holes and saturate the foam underneath. Now it is true, we're going to be installing a silk film over the uh, foam, which will help prevent water from leaking into the foam, but it's only preventative. Okay, so you may want to consider whether or not you want to put pleats in. If you cover the entire foam with a vinyl piece and basically just have piping like it is here, then you won't have as much water leaking into the foam and saturating it. It is your choice. The seat was attached. We removed the screws that mounted it to this hardware. On the bottom side of the cushion there are flat mounts. We'll remove those. On the underside of this cushion was a cambric dust cover material, which is not great for outdoor applications. We will instead be using a cushion underlining fabric on the underside of the cushion when it's done. We'll show that later on. These slots in the underside of the backer board are meant for ventilation, so the foam, if it gets wet, can dry out quickly. Now all we need to do is remove the vinyl fabric from the backer board. Visit the Sailrite website and you'll find a variety of staple removers or lifters. The owner of this pontoon boat has chosen to reuse the backer boards. It's not a bad idea to cut new backer board material out of marine quality plywood. This backer board is a perfect rectangle, but if it were not, it's a good idea to label it uh, the front and the back and which side the foam was on. Okay, here you can see that the uh, fabric pole is in between here and there are some staples in it. It was attached here, but it gave up the ghost here. So it actually became loose from the board that it was stapled to. And that's part of the reason it wasn't pulled in there. So now we're going to just remove the foam from here and inspect a little bit more closely. Everywhere where the uh, fabric had holes, the vinyl has holes, the foam deteriorated in those spots. And here's the foam to the back, which we will probably replace. And here's the fabric pole. And if you're a squirrel, here's a nut. So usually silk film is covering all the foam, but you can see here this silk film deteriorated, probably when the, there were holes in here and so forth. So here's some silk film here. I don't see much evidence of silk film over here. I don't know where it went. It should have been in here. Here's some of it. Oh, maybe it's, oh, okay, I see, it was over here. So once the uh, vinyl was compromised, everything started falling apart. The next step, cutting and shaping new foam. We're not gonna use the old foam. Okay, if we decided to use the foam over, which I don't think we're going to in this situation, but let's say that we were. See these indents in the foam? They uh, don't look good and they also may cause you to feel that there's a uh, divot there. 
Probably not, but because when everything is compressed, it'll actually compress its way out. But if you use steam, if you notice how deep this, this indent is here, if you use steam on it, I'm just gonna put it on this one spot, with a polyurethane foam, this will typically take those out, these impressions or indents in the foam. So see how much smoother it is across the surface now, whereas it used to be more like this. Okay, we have our foam laying on top of our backer board. I'm gonna remove one of the pieces here, and this is the side of the board that the foam rests on. And I'm gonna basically pla place a line here where the two pieces of foam intersect. Right on the backer board. This line will be used later on when it comes time to staple the fabric pole, or what sometimes people call stretcher. So I position my board with, this is the side that the foam rests on, with the front, this is the edge roll for the front, and this is the piece for the back, which has three inch foam. This has about four inch foam up here on the edge roll. So I position it a quarter inch from the board here and a quarter inch from the board here. And this board looks like it's a perfect rectangle. So here's my mark that I marked on the board indicating where the two pieces of foam come together. And again, I want that to be a quarter inch past that mark. And I'll do that over here. And then we'll confirm that it's also straight. So quarter inch past that mark. If you had to trace around your board, let's say it weren't square like this uh, to match our foam, you would place your marker uh, like this, which basically gives you a quarter inch extra foam around the perimeter. Okay, so now we can move this and we're gonna make sure that this, this line and this line are the same distance. We'll then strike a line from mark to mark. The Sayrite blade foam saw works perfect for applications like this. It has a base that the blade runs on so your cut is almost perfectly 90 degrees to the foam edge. We've chosen to use a medium density polyurethane antimicrobial foam in a medium firmness that is available from Sayrite. Since this foam has an antimicrobial treatment, that will prevent the mold and mildew from growing in nice the head. foam. Okay, these are uh, the tea nuts uh, were totally rusted out, so we're going to put new tea nuts in their place. If they don't uh, hammer in well, you may have to glue them. That one's going to stay. So with that one. I've marked the board with a marker, back side, front side, and this is a side with the foam. So this is the back side, this gets this piece of foam that we cut. We want to lay it on the back portion with the uh, foam overlaying the edges by approximately a quarter inch as we designed it. For the bolster, or the front of the cushion, we need to cut and shape the foam. The thickness of this foam is about four and a half. This old polyurethane foam is not very dense, it's pretty easy to compress it. But you'll notice here, when we shape this foam, that this is actually higher than our four inch foam here. We're gonna resolve that by tr trimming this uh, foam and shaping it to the approximate uh, roll of this. But we're gonna wrap it with a sew foam over the top after we're done shaping it. So in the end, it will be pretty much the same thickness as this, or same height, I should say, as this. So we can see that we're going to cut the width. Uh, this is about seven and a half, but it always compresses slightly. So I think I'm going to cut it about eight inches just to make sure that my new foam is uh, wide enough this direction. So eight inch, just marking in a few spots, then I'll strike a line. This is the front of our cushion. It is a four inch thick foam and we will be shaping it so that it has the rounded appearance of the front of the cushion, which we call a bolster. Now, if you don't have a fancy foam cutter that you can get at Sarat like this, you can actually use a hacksaw blade or a bread knife. So we're gonna show that real quick too, but you do have to hold it 90 degrees. So 
So this is a little bit more cumbersome, but uh, it does work. If we had a second helper, we could have them hold the foam because the more the foam bounces, the less the hacksaw blade will cut. You can also use an electric kitchen knife, which we will show as well. This is the last piece we need to cut for this seat cushion, though we do have other seat cushions, so we're going to show you a few more tricks as we cut the foam for those other seat cushions. Electric uh, kitchen knife can also work too with the medium density foam. So you can see the edge that I cut with the blade foam saw is obviously much straighter than the edge I cut with the hacksaw. Did you know you can glue sections of foam together to add to their length or width or even height? Here we are gluing two pieces of foam together to add to the length and we're using foam lock spray adhesive available from Sayerite. Now we'll wait for that to become tacky. When you can touch it with your finger and it tacks up, you know it's ready to be uh, bonded together. Let's get that paper out of the way so we don't have to worry about it. Gluing foam is typical in upholstery applications. If the foam is too short or if it needs just a couple inches added to it, you can cut sections off of other pieces of foam and glue them together as we are here. You will not typically feel the joint at all once the cover is installed. So we have our old foam bookend to the new foam and what I'm going to use is I'm going to use my marker. Remember this is compressed a little bit, so uh, I, I'm especially at the end, I'm going to use my marker and try to get a measurement that will be a little bit bigger than, than our original piece. There. So down the length, I'm going to strike a line. That way I can use that as a reference uh, to where to cut with my blade. And then I'm going to put a line here as well. So we put a straight edge on here and just strike this line all the way across, making sure that it's straight or parallel with the foam. Then we'll do that same thing here with this mark. Okay, if we were to cut from line to line that I struck on there, using this uh, ruler here that's clear, you can see we'll cut into the arch a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut outside of that, these two lines. They're used as a reference. I believe it's the same thing with this. Yep, see we'd be cutting into the arch there. So again, we're going to cut to the outside of those lines using them as a reference. The easiest way to cut this uh, wedge from the two sides is to use the Sayerite blade foam saw. Here we're using it with the base installed. That base can also be removed. This keeps our cut line nice and straight because you can easily control it so you get the appropriate angle down the length of our foam. The more consistent this cut is, the easier it will be to shape the foam. An alternative is to use a electric kitchen knife that is used often for Thanksgiving dinners. Here it works fairly well. It's a little bit more difficult to control the blade and it doesn't cut nearly as well as the Sayerite blade foam saw, but it does work. Take your time and go slow, trying to keep that blade at the consistent angle and so it doesn't cut notches or wedges out of the foam. We're only going to cut about two feet of the foam with the electric kitchen knife. Then we're going to switch back to the Sayerite blade foam saw because it does a much better job. Here the base of the Sayerite foam saw has been removed. So depending on the wedge, if that base gets in the way, you can operate it without it if you like. This is almost the maximum length that we need for our cushion, so we're going to stop cutting our wedge here. Now let's compare the two cuts. So as you can see, the electric uh, kitchen knife works fairly well, but I've got a lot more inconsistencies in the foam. And this will only work with a medium density or lower. It will not work well with a high density foam. Whereas the Sayerite blade foam saw, if you look over here where we started, it's so much more consistent 
than the electric kitchen knife. And this works with medium density, high density, low density foams, and you will get more consistent cuts with it. Now it's time to shape the foam. For the DIYer, a lid off of a, I believe it's a spaghetti, uh, glass spaghetti container works well as a sander. And I'm just gonna use a screw and punch some holes in it to make a, grind, a uh, shaping tool for my foam. So we found for DIYers that a tool like this actually works quite well because it, you can't make a mistake. It is such a slow process. So all I'm going to do is just come across the foam and shape the edges so they are round. Now a good cut makes this job much easier because I don't have to worry about all these gouges from the electric kitchen knife that's over here. I'm going to have to work on getting those out. So using a tool like this, we can shape the foam slowly. And because it's, it's not on a tool, it's nearly impossible to create a gouge in your foam. So you can shape foam slowly. This is almost like being an expert uh, carver or, or um, what do you call it, sculptor. Uh, that's basically all you're doing here is you're sculpting the foam, making sure that you're not creating any gouges or indents in the foam as you go and giving it a rounded look. This tool actually works well with medium density foams and high density foams as long as they're a polyurethane foam. And you can make it yourself. So here's the side that was cut with electric kitchen knife all the way to here, and you can see there's more gouges. So we're going to have to try to work those gouges out, but I think we can do that with the shaper as well. Definitely an indent there. So we want to look down the uh, length of this and make sure that we don't have any pits or any spots that are a little bit uh, larger than others. At the ends it's kind of hard to do because it's the ends, but uh, We'll get those a little bit better too. I'm just looking over the overall shape of it. It looks pretty good on both sides. Now this is a 60 grit, grit sanding block and you can use this to do your final shaping. It's not going to take off much, but it is going to take off all those loose fibers. Um, it does take off a little bit at a time. So if you want to do your final shaping, make sure everything still looks good. You can use a sanding block like this. Okay, we vacuumed it, and now we're going to blow off any excess that might be on the foam. Okay. Using our uh, back piece, we're going to mark this to the same length and cut it to size. Okay, this is one of the end profiles that we cut off, but we need to mark around it so that we know how to cut all the future ones to the exact same shape. So we're going to mark on this Durascrim pattern material right around the perimeter of it. And that way we know how all the other foam needs to be cut. There are several seats that need to be made okay. the same. This is so foam, quarter inch. And all I'm doing is cutting a little bit oversized right now. So if, you, if there are any inconsistencies, this can help with that. And also because of the fact that we need our foam a little bit thicker. So this sew foam has a fabric backing on one side meant to hold a stitch if you have to sew through it for channeling. And then on the other side, the polyurethane foam. We're going to apply the glue to the uh, fabric side. We're going to glue it with the uh, foam lock spray adhesive from Sayerite. So we want to apply the glue in one direction down the entire length, then we'll apply it in the other direction. Then for a permanent bond, you want to spray the uh, foam on the top and the two sides, not these ends. Same process, coat it well. 
Okay, the glue is now tacky. We waited a few minutes. And what I like to do is lay the uh, sew foam on the tabletop, making sure that this is centered because it's about the width of our foam. And then laying it down carefully. Once it's down, it sticks really well. Now I'll start at the center and pull it up, applying a little bit of pressure. We do not need more thickness than just this quarter inch. You could use a half inch if you needed more, or you could wrap to the underside as well. We don't need to do that. And the same thing with this one. We'll cut off the excess with scissors. It can gum up your scissors even if the glue becomes uh, cured all the way. So you may want to use an old pair of scissors rather than a good the sides pair. Sides are really nice. The rounded front oh, awesome. of our cushion or bolster portion of our seat cushion is now complete. The next up is patterning. We're going to be using a high quality four-way stretch vinyl from Sailrite. Here's a sneak peek at what the end of the cushion looks like. It has two boxing pieces that are joined together with a piping strip down the middle. We're going to pattern for this next. So the backer board is underneath here and I have the foam positioned so that it's uh, even on all the edges. Okay, so I'm going to spray this with some glue just to get the pattern material to stick. Don't worry, this when it dries it won't be sticky to anything else. And then I have a straight edge on some Duraskrim pattern material. And I'm going to make sure that straight edge is up against the table. And then stick that to the edge of the foam. So now we'll trace around this right on the edge of the foam. This creates the pattern for the side boxing. We only need to do this on one side. The opposite side is the same. We'll just mirror these uh, patterns when it comes time to cut out our vinyl fabric. Okay, and then we'll mark the uh, a point in the middle to where we're going to line things up. And we'll call this A and A. Now we can take this off and cut it out. We're going to call this A and this A. Now here at this edge, we need to have this be rounded. We don't want a 90 degree edge here. So you can, you can use a cup if you want, but just a rounded edge here at the front. Or I'm sorry, the back. At this edge, we want this rounded. We do not want a 90 degree corner here. Now here, at the junction, where these two come together, there's going, we're going to mark it a half inch from this edge. So I'm just basically marking it randomly at a half inch where the junction comes together. So a half inch down. And we also need to add uh, four inches to the bottom edge to wrap around the backer board. This is the patterning for the two ends. Now for the two plates. Okay, we measured the uh, overall length and it's 57 and 3 quarter. That would be the same for both this one and that one. When measuring for the length of these plates, we want to take away one inch. In doing this, when the vinyl is pulled over the foam, it'll be a nice tight fit and look better. And notice that there are two top plates, one on the front and one on the back. We need to measure from the junction where they're joined together. Then from the junction, now we all have seam allowance, but we're going to have extra fabric that wraps around the back or board. We measure from that junction down to the tabletop, and I have about 14 and a half inches. We'll add four inches to that. Then for this junction, measured from the junction down to the tabletop, and I have about 12 and a half inches there. So we'll add four inches to that as well. 57 and three quarter minus one inch because we want the plate to be smaller than our foam is 56 and three quarter for the length. And then 14 and a half plus about four inches we rounded 18. 12 and a half plus four inches 17. So that means I need, new, need two plates basically 56 and three quarter, 56 and three quarter by 18 by 17.
that one, and that one. Let's look ahead at the finished product to discuss why we cut the plates this way. You may be asking, what about seam allowance? Well, you're right. Seam allowance will take up another inch of the fabric along its length. So in a way, we're actually two inches shorter than the length of the foam. But when working with a four-way stretch vinyl, Eversoft from Sailrite, you'll find that this gives the cushion or the vinyl fabric a better look and that fabric can be stretched over the foam for a nice tight fit. As you can see here we're stapling only a portion of the vinyl fabric over our backer board and if we look at the top surface we can see that it's a nice tight fit and the uh, sides are lined up with the corner of the foam so our overall measurements were perfect. This is Eversoft vinyl available from Sailrite. It is an awesome marine and indoor and outdoor vinyl. Notice it stretches along the uh, length of the fabric. It's a four-way stretch fabric and it stretches along the width of the fabric. Obviously it stretches on the bias like all fabrics typically do. So you can form this around your project a lot easier. And if you look at the texture of the fabric, it's got a cool texture that feels nice and soft, thus the name Eversoft. So my fabric, uh, my plates are 19 uh, by 56 and 3 quarter. This fabric is around 54 inches, so we have to run the 56 down the length of the fabric. So now we just mark the fabric sizes. We're measuring on the back side of the fabric and then we'll strike lines and cut for the two plates, one for the front and one for the back of the cushion. My fabric is wrong side up. Right now my patterns are right side up. I need two of this and two of this so I will flip them when I do the next two so that we have mirrored images. I'm going to put something a little bit heavy on this so that I can trace around the perimeter. We're using the patterns we made off of the uh, foam that we cut and creating the end boxing pieces. So here's my half inch. I'm going to mark that on the fabric. And my A. I'm going to definitely mark that. I need that. And the same thing on this panel. Half inch here, A here. This is where they'll be joined up. Now I need to add the four inches down here. So we're going to add more fabric all the way down. The extra four inches will account for fabric that wraps around the backer board and also for seam allowance to join these two plates together. Okay, so we have these two cut out. Now we're going to mirror them to make the second part. So we're going to flip them and then just use these and trace around them and cut these out. Flip it. Next, we'll be making piping from the Eversoft fabric available from Sailrite. Let's show you how to do it. I'm using the clear acrylic ruler and we're making uh, strips for piping. This piping is one and a half inches in width. And I really don't want to have a seam in this piping, though it is customary to have one. I want to have the seam uh, not be across the length of the cushion, which is about 57 inches or so. So I'm going to make it uh, probably another uh, 15 to 20 inches longer without a seam. Now notice that I'm not cutting this on the bias. This is a uh, straight cut um, piping. Um, this is a four-way stretch vinyl, so it should go around corners beautifully. And, and in fact, for most of my vinyl applications, I do not cut bias cut um, piping um, because of the fact that you can cut slits in the in the flange and it goes around corners nicely. Here's a look ahead at the piping that we're making. This is a straight cut piping. I did not cut it on the bias. And because of that, at the corner, I'm cutting notches out of the flange. This will allow the piping to take that corner smoothly and nicely. So that's why we don't cut bias piping typically for vinyl applications, especially in an Eversoft uh, vinyl, which is a four-way stretch. So I cut two strips for this one cushion because we do need excess uh, extra piping uh, that goes around uh, some of the other parts of the cushion. So I will have to join these two strips together. But as I talked about earlier, we have one long strip that goes across the entire length of the cushion that will not have a seam in it. So the fabric is facing uh, outside surface up 
and we're just going to do this to the ends and, and cut a 45 degree. So my, my clear acrylic ruler is on the 45 degree mark and we're just going to strike a line here. And we'll cut this off. Okay, so now we take our strip and we take this one face down and we go 90 degrees to the other one. So outside surfaces are facing each other. And then what we should have is we should have two corners that look just like that. Okay, we're going to sew from this junction to this yeah, junction really with a straight stitch. Okay. And we're going to set our okay. stitch okay. length to about four millimeter. In retrospect, it's probably better to set your stitch length to three to two millimeters when joining ends of piping strips together. The smaller stitch length will help to keep the vinyl pushed together when it is uh, splayed open and sewn around the piping. So three to two millimeters would probably be a little bit better. Four millimeters will work. Okay, this is a 5 30 seconds inch piping and it's uh, kind of like a foam, it doesn't soak up water. And it's not really pliable, but uh, it does feel great for marine cushions. So we're gonna just basically fold this into the middle of this, trying to keep the edges as lined up as we can. And we're using a quarter inch uh, cording foot for the Sayrite Fabricator sewing machine. It has a tunnel underneath it. I'm going to set my stitch length uh, fairly long. This is all we're doing is basically holding this piping together um, so we can take it to the cushion and sew it. So I'm going to set it at about seven millimeters. Six millimeters is fine too. We'll be sewing this entire cushion with the Sayrite Fabricator sewing machine with the table and the workhorse servo motor. A phenomenal sewing machine package for upholstery applications like this. We're also using V92 polyester thread and a size number 20 needle. So here's what it looks like. Beautiful stitch right next to that piping. And if you flip it over, we've got a beautiful stitch here. The piping looks great. Here we're matched up perfectly. Here we're a little bit off. I try to avoid that, but it's not going to be a big deal in the end. And you'll see that when we go to sew this onto the plates. So here we have where we joined uh, two pieces of piping uh, fabric together. So I'm going to splay this open, lay it flat, and then lay my piping in the middle of that. That keeps this less pronounced. Then I'll fold over it like this. The Sayrite Ultrafeed sewing machines also work great for sewing this type of application. They include a cording tunnel in the standard feet while the Sayrite Fabricator requires you to purchase a cording foot to sew piping like this. So here's what the joint looks like. Don't worry about the flange as much. You're going to be sewing into that flange. Not too bad looking. We cut our Eversoft vinyl fabric to one and a half inches in width and folded it around the piping. So let's measure the flange now. So we cut the, uh, the uh, cover for the piping at one and a half inches and if you look at it here where our stitch is, that leaves us with about a half inch tail, a little bit shy, shy of a half inch, but that's just perfect for what we want because we're going to use a half inch seam allowance. Next we'll sew the sides onto the front bolster plate. So here's one of the old cushions. Because this piping goes underneath this piping, we have to do this in the correct order. So to do this, we're going to join this plate to this boxing first. Then we're going to join this plate to this boxing, obviously with the piping sewn on already here. Then it is sewn together all the way down here. That way this piping is underneath that piping. These are the two ends. These go together. This, go, this goes together for the opposite side. A is where they are matched up and the line up here is seam allowance. A uh, half inch down from the junction here. So we have to sew piping onto these first. This one has no piping. So we're going to move this out of the way for now. So I want my piping, this is the back side, to be sewn on all around to here. 
and it's basically going to end here at this junction. So I'm going to make it a little bit long, but I'm going to stop sewing very close to this line, probably a little bit past it. Same thing over here. We're going to sew the piping on here, come down here, I'm going to sew a little bit past and then leave a little tail of the piping here. So I'm going to transfer this mark and this mark to the opposite side. So we're going to flip it over. Outside surfaces are now up and this mark is here. So I'm going to put that mark very lightly in my vinyl at that location and the same thing here. So we're going to roll, we're going to line up the raw edges of the uh, fabric as we sew around the perimeter. And I'm also going to reduce my stitch length to about six or five millimeters. I'm going to go five. There is no reason to do any reversing here at the beginning. This portion of the fabric will roll under the backer board and be stapled to it at that bottom edge. Remember, we added four inches of extra fabric there. Now when we get to this curve here, I'm going to cut some, a few notches in the flange to help it to go around the uh, corner a little bit more smoothly. I guess they're really not notches, they're just slits. See how it spreads the flange apart so you can follow that corner? The piping is being fed underneath the cording foot that is installed on this, the Sailrite Fabricator sewing machine, available from Sailrite. You can bury the needle and make, uh, lift the foot slightly if you want to make a little bit sharper turns. I didn't really need to, I was just trying to show, demonstrate how that can be done. Same thing here. Don't cut into your uh, first stitches. You don't want to see any of these cut marks when you're done. So they're just shy of the stitch that holds the piping cover on. Now there's our mark that we talked about. So we want to stop sewing somewhere, probably right down here, because it's going to be overlapped by another piece later on. We can always rip up the stitches if we go too far, if we have to. I'm going to do just a little bit of reversing. That's it. So there's our piece. So here's where I want to start sewing. I'm going to leave the flange a little bit long here. We're going to sew in the opposite direction on this piece, not starting from the opposite end. This is exactly the same process as was done before, except for we start on the opposite end. This is the panel we just finished. It is sewing on starting here. And then what it does is you want the outside surfaces to face each other. There's my mark for a half inch uh, seam allowance. So that mark basically uh, is started right like that. So there's the mark, there's the edge of the fabric. Then it is sewn on like this. There you go. And we do the same thing to the opposite side. Okay, so here are our pieces. Outside surfaces are together. There's our half inch mark. It gets lined up to the bottom edge of this fabric here and we want to start sewing around the perimeter. Now you have to have a cording foot on because there is cording underneath there and we're sewing up against the cording. So I'll just start a little bit outside of that even though I'm not going to be sewing it together until probably one or two stitches. I'm at five millimeters for my stitch length which is pretty good and we'll start sewing here. Oops, make sure I don't go into my piping. There we go. Now the fabric's going to want to shrink up here. And so because of that, I'm gonna, there's already some notches in the flange down below of the piping. I'm going to cut some notches in this so that it will allow it to basically shrink rather than expand. The other one we had to basically make it expand. This one's going to shrink up, you'll see. You'll see how it's wanting to collapse over itself here as I start to match up the edge.
same thing here. I'm going to cut a few slits in this. See how it shrunk, shrunk up a little bit and the flange is over top of itself? That's what those notches helped that to do. Now let's look at it on the outside. Very nice. Now if we're a little bit too far, which we are here, see the, the stitches here? You can always go back and redo that again, which I'm going to put it back in the machine and get closer to that uh, piping there. Uh, nobody sees the inside of the stitches, so don't worry if you see that, because you can always correct it again. Okay, so here is our end that we just sewed. So this is the end that it was sewn to, so we follow that down the fabric, because we don't want to get this on the wrong end of the fabric. So it goes on here. There's my half inch mark. This is just a matchup mark. So it would start here, like this, and then this would be sewn on like that. Okay? But, uh, we're sewing in this direction. So what do you do? So what you do is you flip the assembly. Okay? So we flip this, I'm holding it right here, and I flip it like this. And now we have to take that half inch mark that's here and transfer it to the outside of the fabric right there on the flange. Okay, so now the edge of the fabric, this is the short edge, this is the long edge, is matched up to that mark, and then we sew around the piping this direction. And again, I'm going to start off of the fabric, and then I'll catch my fabric, it doesn't really matter. probably have to rip those stitches, so I think I won't do that. So I'm going to start on the fabric, because otherwise I'm going to have to rip those stitches when I cut that piping. Right there. And I'm going to bury my needle, hopefully not losing my trailing thread, and I didn't, thank God. Two passes. Now, this fabric, as it goes around the corner, we're going to cut into the flange of it, going no deeper than a half inch to get around this curve. because the curve is immediately upon us. Make sure everything's flat as you sew. And the cording foot is on, so the cording's in the tunnel. Matching up the edges as we sew. Throughout this video, you're gonna see some close-up shots of the Eversoft indoor-outdoor vinyl fabric that we're using in the video. The texture is just gorgeous. It's a great fabric to work with and a four-way stretch. It's only available at Sailrite. Coming to another uh, curve, so I'm going to cut some notches in, in my uh, plate. To allow it to go around that curve nice and smoothly. Make sure that when I'm sewing, I have no bumps in my piping in the area I'm sewing. We're sewing with the Sayerite Fabricator sewing machine. It's set up with the workhorse servo motor. That's why we have all this slow speed control. The remaining process is done exactly in the same way, except for we're just starting from the opposite end. Let's move on. Next, we'll concentrate on sewing the sides on the back portion of the plate. 
So this is our front cushion and it is done. We've got the side sewn on. This is our uh, back portion of the cushion and this is the boxing sides. So what they do, here's our A in reference to matching it up with the A on this panel and here's our half inch seam allowance. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this here and how this will go on is that you'll sew it on like this, sew it on like this, and like this. So it'll basically be an end like that. So you want to take it over to the table and confirm that you have the right panel on the right side. So this panel would be the same. So we're going to sew a half inch from the raw edges, matching it up as we go. And then we'll do a little bit of reversing here. You'll notice we left the cording foot on to sew this uh, panel together that has no piping. That is customarily done. If a project has piping, typically the foot is not interchanged with the standard foot. I'm using the half inch on the needle plate as my guide. Now if your project did not have piping, I would use the standard foot that comes with the sewing machine. But as you can see, this one works. Now here at this corner, it is a gradual curve, so I chose not to insert a few slits to allow the fabric uh, to shrink up here. Uh, you can do that if you'd like. Um, it can be done without doing that. You'll notice that it's wrinkling up, and, and in fact the cording foot's getting stuck on one of the wrinkles, but uh, it actually fed okay, so we don't have to worry about that. So no slits were made at that gradual turn. Don't worry if the bottom edges don't line up. Remember, we added four extra inches to the side pieces. That is more material than we need to staple onto the backer board. The old cushions did not have a top stitch. We have decided to add a top stitch, and that's what we're gonna show next. Now I wanna look and make sure that we don't have any wrinkles in there or anything, and we don't. Everything looks nice. Now we're gonna do a top stitch. And to do that, you see that some of this fabric is actually wrinkled here. If we cut some relief slits in there, this will help it to relax. Just don't want to go deeper than your seam allowance. That'll make that top stitch look a little bit better at that curve. There we go. See how it's relaxing a little bit better? So the tail, if I put it on this, the boxing side, then my uh, stitch will be like this. My top stitch would be here. And water could catch in there. So what I like to do is I like to put the top stitch on the plate. So I will roll the tail around, the half inch tail, on the plate side. So my top stitch here, thus the water acts like a shingle and goes down the side of the cushion. So I'm going to sew using this foot as a guide and my stitch is set at about five and a half millimeters which I'm happy with and we'll just sew. So I want to splay the fabric both left and right and make sure my tail's here, my half inch tail on the underside and it is. So I'm going to pull the fabric apart as I sew this top stitch. Now it's getting caught on this cording foot. All I need to do is raise the cording foot and get that off of the end. That's only going to get caught on the edge. Now it's free. Take your time. Sew slowly here because this stitch is totally visible. When you stop, bury your needle so that you don't lose your spot. Okay, I'm getting to that, where that corner is, so I'm going to just do it slowly here, making sure my fabric is laying flat and pulled apart left and right. And now stop and smooth out another section every few inches, making sure my tail is uh, going the right direction, and it is. I can feel it. Now, notice that my fabric is bunched up again because I got that cording foot on. So I'm going to lift my foot with my needle buried and push the fabric out from underneath the cording foot. Standard foot would probably prevent that completely from happening, but you, as long as you pay attention, you'll be fine. Now I'm almost to my straightaway. 
working with this ever soft vinyl fabric for indoor and outdoor applications is a lot of fun. I loved working with this vinyl fabric and I love the feel and the texture of it. And the warranty is great as well. Excellent for indoor and outdoor applications like this pontoon seat. There we go. Now that reinforces that stitch. Now is it necessary to sew this top stitch in place? Not at all. You could skip that part, but this makes it for a much stronger seam. In my opinion, it also looks better too. Now we need to do the other side in the same manner. Okay, this is the right corner to start on. So I would sew here and sew down like that, except for I can't sew in that direction this way. So what I have to do is I have to flip this assembly. So I'm gonna flip it completely over so the boxing is on the underside and the plate's on top. So now there's my boxing. So outside surfaces are facing each other. I still start at this corner. But the process is done exactly in the same way. It's just that we're working upside down. We will not show all of this since it's done in exactly the same way. Let's move on. Skipping ahead, here we are installing the last few stitches of the top stitch for the opposite end. There's what that, that underside looks like. Here's the uh, first stitch and there's the top stitch in the half inch tail. Okay, so piping now gets sewn onto this, the back portion of the seat, from here all the way down. Now this is the fabric piece that will cover the back of the seat and we are sewing down the length of it where this piece will join the uh, front piece, the front piece that has the contoured shape. Here we're using the Sarat Fabricator sewing machine with that cording foot installed in that machine and all we do is sew down the entire length. Before those two halves can be joined together, we need to add a fabric pole, or what some people call a stretcher. Okay, so what we're doing here is one, two, three, four. We're cutting a four inch rectangle for our fabric pole. And why is it four inches? The thickness of our uh, smallest foam is three inches. We need a half inch for seam allowance and we need half inch for stapling. So that's why I'm cutting four inches here. Our foam in the front of the cushion is almost four and a half inches. So this will pull the vinyl fabric into that seam so it looks nice. Now, once I've cut it to four inches, what I should have done as well is mark a half inch location because this is where I'm going to staple it. I'm going to put my clear acrylic ruler on the fabric and strike a line half inch from that edge. This will be right where I staple it to the backer board. So we need to think about how this goes together. This is where they intersect, okay, these two panels. Not here, this is the very front of the cushion. So outside surfaces of this would be facing the outside surfaces of that and it'd be sewn on like this. I'm gonna hold it together with my fingers and then it would be splayed apart like that. So what you would see is a beautiful finished edge that looks like like that. Okay, so we have it together right. We've thought this all through. That's very important. Think it all through, lay things out. Now, we could sew this fabric pole on after these are sewn together, but since we know how it's gonna go together, we know that we can sew it on to this piece by itself now, and it will not be visible in the end. So in the end, what'll happen is this will come down, create a fold here, half inch fold on my stitch line, and it will be used to pull this assembly onto the backer board. So we can do that now, or you can sew this together and then sew it on just as we are going to do now. But I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sew this on right now and it'll go on like that. 
So here, there's my half inch mark that I marked on the fabric. I marked it on both sides, so I didn't have to think about what size I'm using, side I'm using. Uh, we're using a stable fabric. This is a, uh, a Surelast fabric, top notch nine. Anything that's stable will work great. This is basically a polyester fabric that we're gonna use as our fabric pole. So I'm very close to the edge where my piping was sewn together, and I'm gonna sew about a quarter inch from this raw edge to secure this in place. I'm gonna do some reversing. I'm gonna sew backwards as close as I can to that piping without going into the piping. The reason we're sewing a quarter inch from the edge of the fabric is we don't want this stitch to show up when we sew the two panels together when we go to sew the half inch seam allowance. So I'm almost to the end here and I have too much fabric. So I'm just gonna cut the excess off right about at that piping straight across. We'll just sew all the way to the end and do some reversing. We will not show that. Let's move on. And now those two halves can be joined together. That's next. So at this juncture right here where there's excess piping, if you've stitched it down, you need to release some of the stitches because you really want to cut this piping so that it is flush with the edge of this fabric or very close to being flush. So I'm going to cut it right there without cutting any of my plate or boxing. Okay, I'll do the same thing on the other side. Now, this is a four-way stretch vinyl, and because of that, it has a tendency to be easily stretched by your sewing. So I'm going to apply quarter-inch basting tape to the flange of the piping, very far from my, where my stitch will be created, so my double-sided tape doesn't show up when the cushion is cover is turned right side out. So this will help us to pre-baste everything in place prior to sewing so that if we don't like its position we can reposition it because we want everything to be centered. So I'm going to fold my fabric together where this piping is and find the center. So right there is my center, and I'm going to take my scissors and cut a teeny notch in it. Okay, so that's the center of that panel. Now I'll do the same thing with this one. I'm going to fold it onto the seams, so the seams are directly across from each other. And this is the center of this one. I'm going to peel off the transfer paper, revealing the glue. And I will start at that center location. So there's the center location there. Here's the center location here. So we'll baste in one direction first without pulling too much on this top panel because we don't want to stretch it. We just want to match up the raw edges. Since this is a four-way stretch vinyl, it can pull easily, so don't pull too much. And remember that any time you sew on a fabric, no matter what it is, it'll have a tendency to shrink up the fabric every time you sew. If we've done it right, the piping should be almost in line with this stitch, which it is. So I really like that. If, we d if it doesn't come out, what you can do is unbaste it and kind of pull on one panel more than the other as you baste it together but I like the way this one's coming out. Let's baste over there before I finish, just to make sure this one comes out okay. So now we're basting from the center position out the other direction. Ah, look, way off by a good inch. See the difference? There's my seam and there's my piping. We need to make adjustments. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna unbase this and move it over to my right side, that way. And that will even up this a little bit. This is the beauty of the double-sided tape. You can kind of check things before you take it to the sewing machine to do. So what I'm gonna do, since we know that we had too much over here, is I'm gonna put this piping just outside of that stitch line. 
And now to take up some of that excess fabric, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put base this on with ever so slight wrinkles. They will not be visible when we're done, but basically I'm having this fabric, I'm not pulling on the fabric, I'm shrinking it up slightly. You can see those little bubbles. We'll smooth them out in the end, but this will help us to even up this fabric so that the, the piping lands at the same spot on the left side and the right side. And we should be able to tell that. Yep, look, when I get to the center, see how much more this fabric's over to the left side? In fact, what I'll do is I'll start even it, even it up now because that we only needed to shrink that up there, not on this side. This side, I'll just put it down flat. And because we did that, look at that. The piping is just outside of that stitch, just like it is on the other side. So that's how you can make a fine tune adjustments. And because we basted it, we could redo it again. And now I'll just flatten this out because it's not going to change. The basting tape's holding it in position. Yep, it's almost the same on both sides. Okay, so now we just need to continue basting down the ends. So we know this gets folded down like this, and then this basically follows that edge. Again, don't stretch it too much because you can't actually stretch this panel, this fabric, easily. Right down to there. Okay, now there's a lot of bulk here at this transition, but this is basically how it should rest. Very much to look like that. And what you may want to do is you may want to staple it to, or just pay, pay attention when you take it to the sewing machine and sew it. Now we'll do the same thing on the other side. She's basted in place and we're happy with it. So we're taking it to the sewing machine and we definitely need a cording foot installed for this since we're sewing uh, right next to that piping. The only part that's going to be hard is going over that transitional bump here. Now here's all that bulk. We want things to lay like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to sew over the top of this piping here and it's going to catch that tail. So I don't want to sew through the, the uh, stretcher here. I'm just going to fold it back. When we get to here, we will. Let's concentrate on this junction. I'm going to have to help the machine feed over this. It's a big bump. So I'm going to lower my needle. Actually, I'm going to have my needle out, and then I'm going to push my assembly under there, and then I'm going to roll the balance wheel by hand to get past this. I might have to come back and re-sew that area again. Now the stretcher. So the stretcher, I'm just going to create a fold here. Remember, this is on the inside. Nobody's going to see it, and we'll just sew right through that fold on this, on this end. Now I expect the foot to get caught up on the back edge of this. So again, I'm going to either push with the fabric or take my needle out and lift my presser foot and push this thickness through. There we go. Okay, so there's my piping. It's in the tunnel. And I just want to keep sewing this down. The nice thing about a good cording foot is usually the cording foot will keep the piping in the tunnel. Even though the piping is under multiple layers of fabric, I really don't have to pay much attention to it because the uh, cording foot on this Sarat Fabricator sewing machine is so well built. Okay, my stretcher looks like it's going to get a little bit too close to that and I don't want to ruin it. So I'm just going to cut a slit in it so that it can basically be moved out of the way. I've got everything laying the way I want it. And I'm going to be sewing through that huge transition there here in a second. So again, I might, might have to help the sewing machine sew over this junction. Right here, it's getting stuck. So I'm going to lift my foot and push my assembly. There we go. I might have to re-sew over that again. Let's get it all sewn together first before we go back and concentrate on that. 
this first stitch through that bulky area will compress it slightly. So when we put it in the sewing machine a second time, you'll find it easier to sew over it. There we go. Now, before we re sew anything, let's look and make sure that we're happy with what we got. Oh yeah, that's gonna look good. We are gonna sew over the transitional bump again, but we're not gonna show that. Up next, we'll staple the fabric pole or stretcher onto the backer board. Okay, we're just marking a line a half inch from that line that we scribed on the board. This will be the edge of our fabric pole. We also wanna mark the center for uh, this one, it's 28.5, so I'll just put a C here. That's the center. So we know this is the middle because there's our, our uh, marks we made earlier. So I'm just marking on this uh, that location, both sides. We're marking on the fabric pole or the stretcher. This is the front of our cover. This is the front of our board. This is the center of the board. I put the half inch on the wrong side <laughs> for the way I'm doing it, but who cares? Nobody's gonna see this. So I'm striking another half inch line. So the center is here, our line is here. We match up the fabric to that center line and we staple on our line that we struck on the fabric pole. So the edge of the fabric pole is on that line that we struck a half inch from the line indicating where the two pieces of foam would be uh, laid on the backer board. And we're stapling on the line that we struck on the fabric pole, or sometimes what is called a stretcher. We are using the Sayrite Short Nose Upholstery Staple Gun, a phenomenal staple gun at a great price, and we're using stainless steel staples with a 3 8 inch leg. The half inch crown of the staple gun helps to prevent the staple from pulling through vinyls. Now that we have it in position, we want to put a staple uh, about every inch and a half or so. Make sure that we have a good solid fabric pull. The silk film is uh, actually, if you unfold it, it's 54 inches wide, but we're going to leave it doubled for this so that we get extra protection. It makes it possible to easily wrap uh, the uh, fabric over the foam because the fabric likes to stick to the foam and it also provides a water barrier to make it more water resistant. Now we do have breathe holes or vent holes that are in our wood. We don't want any silk film to go over those. Just roll it over this edge. So the bottom side will be left without silk film. Now I have way too much silk film here. So I'm gonna pull it over and then I'll cut off the excess. Then just to hold everything in place, I've got some packing tape and I'll position it in spots where those uh, vent holes are not and uh, hopefully this will help hold it. And this is only on the bottom side. You don't want to do this on the top side because if you do it on the top side then you'll feel this tape or the front side. You only want to do it at the bottom. We'll repeat the same process with uh, this piece of foam as well. Okay so our foam is wrapped in the silk film we have a little bit of breathability on the bottom. We can position it over top of our backer board, making sure that the ends are even and start pulling our fabric over the top. Mm. Once the vinyl is over the front section of foam, we're gonna flip the board and start doing some preliminary stapling. Mm -hmm. Stapling the Eversoft vinyl fabric to the backer board is next. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to make sure the corners are landing in about the same location, which they are. Um, and then I, we have the fabric pole already stapled in place, so I'm going to put some preliminary staples in here. Uh, everything looks centered. If it wasn't, I'd pull it to the left or the, to the right uh, at this center location. So I'm going to pull snugly. I'm going to put a staple in slightly crooked so it's easy to pull it out. 
probably going to do two. Okay, so there we have that position done. Now what I'd like to do is put a staple here at the side. Again, one that's going to be easy to pull out. So I'm going to hold the gun slightly crooked. And over here. There is excess vinyl that extends into the backer board a little bit too far. So actually where we're stapling now will eventually be cut away. Now we can take it over and turn it over and take a look and see what we have so far. It's looking good. Okay, so that's the uh, forward, or the, uh, yeah, this is the forward piece of foam. Now we're gonna lift this bat over and insert the back piece of foam. This is the bottom side. Without the silk film, this would be very difficult to pull in place, not to mention the water barrier. Now I'll do the same thing with this one. <clears throat> okay, we'll do the same thing on the other side. We have the, the sides are about in the same spot on left and right side. We'll pull it nice and taut and put two temporary staples in. Same thing here. It's basically stapled in place along the two long sides, nothing here. So we want to look at it and make sure that it's a good fit. And it does look like it's going to be good. Notice here when we pull this down, that's going to come down snugly around the, the foam. And then when you pull on this piping down here, that too should come down and give us a nice looking end. So I'm happy with it. So we're going to make sure our flange or our tail is all on the same side, which it is. It's on this side. And then we're going to pull snugly on this tucking that nice and deep in there. And then again, we're gonna put a preliminary staple in here. Probably two. Okay. And we'll do the same thing over here. Okay, so we have it preliminarily stapled in place. Now we're gonna work on our corners. So this will be our first corner. We're gonna actually come down like this, put a staple here, and then create a fold here and we're not going to have this run along the side because we really don't want that to be visible. We're going to have it run kind of at a 45 degree angle this direction. Kind of like that, which I think will look good. Remember, people are not going to see the bottom side of this chair. Now we got some wrinkles here because of these preliminary staples. That'll be no problem. See how they pull out this four way stretch. Uh, this ever soft fabric is very easy to work with. See that? Look at that, you can get that, all the stuff out of here just by pulling on it. And we're gonna staple around the perimeter very close later on. A staple here, right along the angle that I wanna create. And that's a permanent staple that I put in there. So again, I'm gonna put a permanent staple here, very close to that edge. And then we can pull tautly here, taut. Make sure that it looks good. It does. Put some staples here. I'm going to push down really firmly here. There we go. Now we'll cut off this excess a little bit later here. Let's concentrate on this corner. Okay, here, same sort of thing. Hold down snugly, 45 degree angle. Nobody's gonna see this bottom side. That looks really good. And we will put a staple here. And here. And we'll make sure that our vinyl's nice and taut. Okay. Maybe one more there. Now, what do we got going on here? Let's take a look at it before we move on. Pretty good. 
pull it tight here. Should be able to get that looking great. It actually looks great right now. So now that we have the corners down, we can take these two staples out. And then we can pull on this until we get it nice and taut. Does that look good, Seth? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my hand was, was over top of my stapler. I'm going to put a staple here. These staples are permanent here. They're placed about an inch or an inch and a half away from the edge of the board. In doing this, later on we'll be able to staple on a cushion underlining to give the backside a finished look. We'll be stapling uh, closer to the edge of the board when we do that. So when that cushion underlining material is stapled onto the backside, it will hide these staples completely. Beautiful. Now we're going to repeat that same procedure on this end. Look at this big wrinkle. Now if this were not a four-way stretch like the Eversoft material, you might have some problems with that. I'm going to take out these preliminary staples here and watch what we can do here. Because it's a four-way stretch, I can pull very snugly on it and work out wrinkles nicely. The Sayrite upholstery staple gun uses a half-inch crown staple. It's wider than the standard staple gun, so it doesn't easily cut through vinyl fabrics as they often do. Now what I like to do is I like to um, start on this side and then move to the other side. We want to make sure that we don't pull so snugly that we get unevenness along the top here, which is a possibility if you don't pull consistently across the entire uh, length of the cushion. So be careful about doing that. Again, we have a lot of wrinkles here at this uh, corner, but uh, we should be able to distribute those down the length. The temporary staples are removed so we can apply constant tension down the uh, length of this cushion. That area will eventually be cut away. The forward edge is stapled down, but the back edge is not yet. Let's take a look at the forward edge. Very nice. Sweet. Exact same process for the back side. Now we can just cut off this excess. The final step is adding cushion underlining fabric that's also available from Sailrite. We're going to place cushion underlining on the underside. This is a vinyl product and it does have very small holes so it allows for breathability and it gives the cushion an overall finished look. Uh, we can match it up to this edge here and start stapling it in a few locations very close to the uh, edge of the fabric. These are the holes for some hardware that we'll have to screw in later, so before you get this all stapled down, you may want to mark the location of those holes. The cushion underlining material does not need to be hemmed on the edges. It does not unravel. With the cushion underlining fabric uh, stapled to the back side, when the cushion is lifted, it now looks great. If you appreciated this tutorial video, please click the thumbs up to like this video. A big thanks from the Sayerite team for doing this. Don't go away, the materials list and the tools list is coming up next. It is only through your loyal support that these free videos are made available. Thanks for your loyal support. And be sure to subscribe to the Sayerite YouTube channel. Click the bell to be notified of new videos when they become available. Thanks. Our pontoon bench seat cushion is now complete. Now we're going to show the materials list and the quantity of materials that we used to complete this seat cushion. 
As mentioned previously, we used a polyurethane foam with an antimicrobial treatment, which will help prevent mold and mildew. And we also used Eversoft indoor-outdoor vinyl fabric that is a four-way stretch. The quantities that we used here are listed for a single seat cushion. If you'd like to see how to make the backrest cushion, the side arms, and also the base, we have separate videos for those check out the links in the description below. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at SailRight, thanks for watching.